Before we get to the movie, I want to share something with you. I know it's not festival season currently, it's award season, mm -hmm. but I want to get a jump on festival season with my idea for a film festival. It's a really good idea. Yes. It's called the Day and Night Festival. And during the day, all of the movies are Day of Blank, Day of the Jackal, Day of the Locust, Day of the Triffids, etc. Mm -hmm. All the nighttime movies are Night of Blank. Night of the Iguana, Night of the Lepus, Night of the Living Dead, etc. Night of Shooting Stars, yeah. And the bridge movie between night and day is Francois Truffaut's Day for Night. Of course. Of course, you can't have that festival without that movie. So this is a good idea. <laughs> I need someone to give me investment capital so I can make it happen. For people who like movies about days and or nights. The day after... And of a thousand days, you can make it a thousand day festival and just show that every single day. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Thank you for coming back to The Basement to celebrate our longest running tradition. We are going to watch a romantic movie in celebration of Valentine's Day. When I reveal this movie to you, it might just make you want to dance for joy. But any dancing tonight in the basement must be Strictly Ballroom. Oh, hello! Released in 1992, Strictly Ballroom was directed by Baz Luhrmann. He's got a movie nominated this year for Best Picture, don't you know? Yes, he does. It is based on his stage play of the same name and was the first film of his so-called Red Curtain Trilogy. The other two films being Romeo Plus Juliet and Moulin Rouge. It stars Paul Mercurio, Tara Morris, and Bill Hunter. And this DVD was sent to us by a generous viewer to our P.O. Box. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing it again? Yeah, sure. I'd like to see if it holds up. I have my thoughts on Baz Luhrmann now that I didn't have then. If you're going to dance, ballroom or otherwise, rhythm is crucial. And tonight's gift might just help you in that regard. Rhythm is a dancer. Ah, hello. Step out into the spotlight of the old leather couch and get ready to dance your heart out as we watch our hearts out and watch Strictly Ballroom. Beyond Films Limited. <laughs> well, it's not Beyond Films until the end of all creation. <laughs> Strictly Ballroom begins with dancing. Glitzy, glamoury, shellacked haired fellas and ladies all dancing together. Are there ballroom hooligans, like rugby hooligans or football hooligans? Come on, ah! Paul Hastings and his partner Liz are all set to be the champions of the Australian dance competition because they're the best. But then this happens. Samba! It comes down to Paul and Liz and these other two people, and they're kind of dancing dirty. Not dirty dancing. That's a different thing. They get boxed in by this jerk. Doing this stuff to try and mess up Paul and Liz. His name is Scott. They're doing these things to try and mess up Scott and Liz. It was no excuse for what Scott did. <laughs> He broke danced. He resorted to his own flashy, crowd-pleasing steps. Like some sort of entertainer. Non-Federation approved steps. He's showboating. How dare these people wearing all these sequins be flashy! Everyone loves it, except for the people in charge. Because here's the thing about ballroom dancing. You gotta do it right. The person who really doesn't like it is Barry Fife. He doesn't like Scott. The winner is... Double number 69, Ken Rylings and Pam Schultz. And Liz doesn't like it one bit. I'm not dancing with you till you dance like you're supposed to. This is the dance studio that Scott's mother runs. Now we can do this. I don't want us to end up like that drunk Ken Rylings. <laughs> if only you'd showed that passion out on the dance floor. <laughs> Your son isn't even interested in winning at the Pan Pacifics. He and I are no longer partners. She's done with him. He can't play by the rules. His mother is also at high melodrama at all times. He's also got a father that would be Doug, and Doug is a weird fella. Doug is watching that film with all the enthusiasm of a fableman. <laughs> <laughs> There's also Les, who's Shelley's old dance partner back from the 60s. You're still our number one. You're still our Riker. Riker. 
Shut up, Strauss. Scott is alone in the studio. Bullshit. How do you dance again? Feet? <laughs> he dances over here and he dances over there. He dances up and he dances down. Make myself an omelet, and I'm back. <laughs> and he realizes that he's not alone. Fran is there. She's this kind of homely, nice girl who's taking lessons at the dance studio. If you kept it simpler and dance from the heart. What? Oh, I see. dance from the butt. That's you, is it? And she wants to dance with Scott at the Pan Pacific Dance Championship. You want to dance non-federation? Well, for the Klingons? <laughs> well, an open amateur has no right to dance non-federation steps. Dancing non-federation steps is how Captain Kirk defeated the Kobayashi Maru. Ah, well, I don't know. Show me what you got. She doesn't have much, but she's a fast learner. Three, four, and one, two, three. It's this time after time, and they play time after time. So you stop making me cry. No. Sorry. You completely boffed it. You boffed it right in the Galapagos. <laughs> Downstairs, Doug has the place to himself. Please allow me to introduce myself. <laughs> Doug is revealed to be Satan. <laughs> and he does a little bit of private dancing, as Tina Turner would say. Finally, Scott tells Fran, yes, I want you to be my partner. Oh, she's happy. If you're lost, you I don't want a Coca-Cola now. It works! <laughs> yeah, I do. It's true. Do you, do you think the rumba's the right one to do? Yeah. They should do the bossa nova because then if they lose, Friend. then they can blame it on the bossa nova. You know yeah. what I said about the rumba? Then, the great you know, scapegoat of a musical world. I hear clumsiness outside. <laughs> it is Francisca. Someone is disturbing my precious trash. This is here. It was Scott here, Luke, and now he's gone and thrown it all away. Next year he'll be 22 and all washed up. There's no time. Is that kid wearing an Ocean Pacific t-shirt? I used to have one of those. <laughs> they were required. <laughs> Unbeknownst to him, Scott's mom has some machinations going on. It turns out that the legend, Tina Sparkle, is losing her partner. Bloody Nathan's going to announce his retirement tonight. Bloody Nathan. <laughs> and she is the best. She and Scott, if they were together, they're going to win. They're going to win the Pan Pacific. <laughs> yes. It's a double oh, into a quick whip split. With his hands all over her junk. This thing about dancers. The body is full, full access <laughs> to your partner. I wish I was a dancer. Scott doesn't know what to do. Are you going to dance with Tina? Of course I'm going to dance with Tina. It's Tina Sparkle. I know. And they dance. And everyone sees how good they're dancing. Scott's mom takes her aside and says, you need to leave and not dance with my son. You can see it. It would be best for everybody concerned if you just went home and forgot all about this. Now breathe this chloroform. Yes. Don't listen to him, Barry. He, he, he's, uh, he's excited because he's going to... Oh, he just danced. They, they just danced. <laughs> it was a short dance. Scott meets Fran's Spanish family. Her dad doesn't like him at first. Oh, you're a dancer, huh? Can you dance the Paso Doble? Scott says, yeah. We want to see this Paso Doble. <laughs> Go inside, dear. This is man's dancing. <laughs> and he starts to do it. And he doesn't do it. I mean, it looks fine to me. I'm not a dancer nor a Spaniard, but it looked fine to me. But these other characters in the movie, they laugh at him. They think his dancing's ridiculous. What's so funny? There is no paso doble. <laughs> <laughs> then Dad steps up and shows him how it's done. Tequila! Mama's been watching the whole thing. Yes, Papa is a, a great dancer, but this boy has potential. He's got rhythm. I can teach him. So he starts to learn dancing with Fran's family. And he gets good. Fran and Scott get closer and closer and they baso. Scott is cornered by President Fife. I want to tell you about the greatest dancer I've ever seen. Your dad, Doug. What is Doug's secret history? Why does he dance like a loony? 
Doug and Shirley Hastings were the best bloody couple this country had ever seen. And they were going to win the Pan Pacific Grand Prix. But you know what happened? Doug started improvising. He started crowd-pleasing. He started doing his own steps and not the proper steps. Of course they lost. So the lesson this movie is teaching us is that improv is the road to failure. <laughs> He vowed he'd never dance again. He vowed to look like Brian Ferry for the rest of his life. What did anyone tell me? It just never came up. We don't really talk about dancing much. <laughs> he went nowhere, just like you're doing, Scott. Be the best at the boring, man. That's how you win in this life. Just win this competition for Doug. Play by the rules. And do your dad proud. Win the Pan Pacific once, just once, Doug. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Ashenal, Ashenal, Ashenal. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? The pan championship comes around. He's back dancing with Liz and he's doing the boring ballroom dancing by the book. Meanwhile, Fran is stuck in the amateur hour circle. Hola. Hola, raton sin cola. What does that mean? Hello, hello, rat without a tail. I know. And now, ladies and gentlemen, my enormous face. Before Scott can go out, his dad comes and talks to him. I used to be a dancer. Scott says, I know. And I never went anywhere. I know, I know. I heard the whole story from Fife. You danced at the championships and then it didn't go well. I never danced at the Pan Pacific Grand Prix. I think Mr. Fife lied to you. If I would have danced, I might have won. I might have lost, but I would have lived my life instead of living with this tarragon of a mother. That's right, I call her a spice. A tarragon. This termagant. Termagant. You don't dance with your brain. You don't dance to win competitions. You dance because it's in your soul and it's got to come out however you want to express it. And so Scott runs and he catches Fran right before she leaves. And he says, Fran, we've got some dancing to do. He puts on a spangly jacket. They look awesome. I don't know how they do Fran's hair that quickly, but magic of the movies, you know, you got to accept these things. They dance. Despite the fact that they're not even in the competition anymore. Go, yes, Scott, use our dance to entertain white people. <laughs> and Mr. Fife sees this and he loses his mind. Who, it is revealed, has this whole thing rigged anyway. He tries to call him off with the microphone, but Scott's buddy with the fancy sleeves, he unplugs the microphone so Fife can't do anything. They try and cut off the music. The little kids lock the door so they can't get at the music board. Dancing, dancing, dancing. Everyone's impressed. But then the music stops anyway. <laughs> Fife's wife found a way. Scott Hastings and partner are suspended until further notice. So say I, Fife. They don't need music to dance the Spanish dance. All they need is a little bit of rhythm. Buddy, you're a boy, make a big <laughs> noise shouting in the street. And the beat becomes louder and louder and ba-doom. And Scott, oh, piano practice. Cool, thanks. They dance. And this time everyone loves it. Scott and Fran may not be champions, but they are in love. And they are definitely not strictly ballroom. Strictly ballroom. A life lived in fear is a life half-lived. That's still half a life. Huh? It's no surprise that a sentiment like that would be in a movie about dancing. Because all dance movies, whether it's Flashdance, whether it is Billy Elliot, they're really about living. Mm -hmm. Dancing is living. That's right. And living life to its fullest. And even when it's about competition, it's still about pursuing it on your own terms and expressing yourself in a way that is true to yourself and that's really the only way to win. I was concerned before the movie started that it would not be as magical as it was back in 1990 whatever when I saw it. And it still is magical. This huh. movie really really works on me. I'm not a Baz Luhrmann fan and I think this is his only great movie. He has great moments in all of his movies but he presses too hard on the style button, and this is the only one that has at least a semblance of grounding in reality. What did you think of the way they used close-ups? That type of close-up was all over the place. 
in the early 90s. John Waters and David Lynch, let's really look up these guys' nostrils to show yeah. that they're, yeah, they're yeah. human, but monstrous at the same time. Yeah, I didn't like it, but I think that was the point. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was supposed to not like those. The close, but, but they did that on Paul and Fran as well. Mm-hmm. Like they, I felt like the close-ups were too close. I think one of the great things about this movie is that it really makes the audience feel like dancing. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying we're all going to rush out to the nearest Arthur Murray dance studio and take it up, but I can find my own rhythm. I can learn a few dance steps. I like that Fran, and I hesitate to say this, she kind of stays a bit homely throughout the whole thing. She's really making a gradual transition between Ugly Duckling and Beautiful Swan. I, yeah. I, that's a nice change of pace. Mm-hmm. And I also like that they don't win. It's not even a possibility and no one cares. It's not announced who wins. They knock over the trophies at the end. Yeah, and no one comes out and says, Barry Fife, you're fired. Nope. I declare these two the winner. You know, a yeah. dumb ending like that. We don't need it because we got the emotional payoff. One thing that was a bit unremarkable about this movie was the cover of Cindy Lauper's Time After Time that mm-hmm. they used. And it wasn't bad, but... It just makes you appreciate when you hear that song covered how much she nailed it. Yeah. And that she could carry something like that off, or of True Colors, mm-hmm. two beautiful songs. She was such a goof. Yeah. She had that funny <laughs> high voice, and she would go, no, girls just want to have fun. And then she does these two songs, and it, they just floor you. I think the mistake was the fact that they had the words come in. You are a dancer. I'm not a dancer like these guys. Did you have any training? Can you talk about that? No, the government will not allow me to talk about it. I took a ballroom dance in college. During the swing dance craze of the late 90s, I got into it. You went out with Sheila Haynes? I, I swing, went out swing with Sheila. Dancing. She <laughs> taught me a lot. She's great because she makes you feel like you're leading. Sheila's a friend of ours. Yes. I do wish I would have taken more dance, but you catch me in the kitchen with the right song on. I'm a bit of Paul's dad. I'm a bit of a Doug. <laughs> <laughs> the red curtain has come down on Strictly Ballroom, and now it's time for us to have a little post-show talk we like to call Seen It. Seen It! Wilson Douglas McDonald, Elvis, solid movie, Seen It. Seen It. Also by Baz Luhrmann. Yeah, speaking of the guy. Elvis is the story of Elvis, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's about Elvis Mitchell, New York <laughs> Times film critic. <laughs> what did you think of Tom Hanks' performance? Oh, uh, you know, the thing is, the entire movie balances on him. It's told from his point of view. It's almost a biopic of him. Yeah. I just kind of didn't like how they were using the Colonel. Tom Hanks plays Colonel Tom Parker, who is Elvis's controversial manager. I really liked it. Yeah. I thought his performance was great. A lot of people make fun of it, saying that he's going over the top. But I think it just shows that Tom Hanks, he, after all the years, he's still taking chances. You have to keep learning. Yeah. I, just like in Strictly Ballroom. Keep learning, even if you're great. Of course, the man of the hour is the lead. Austin. Yeah, Austin. You know, Elvis. A lot of people are like, oh, he looks just like Elvis. It's like looking at Elvis. And I'm not saying... I don't think he looks anything like Elvis. I don't think he looks like Elvis. But no. it is like looking at Elvis... Because looking at that guy makes you feel like it's 1950-whatever and you see Elvis for the first time. That is the sexiest space alien I've ever seen in my entire life. Spencer Riley writes, I like Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans. The performances by Michelle Williams and Gabriel LaBelle made the long running time worth it. Yes, seen it. Seen it. You know who they don't talk about much? Seth Rogen. Yeah. Every single moment he has in this movie is so real. I have always liked him, but I've never felt like he achieved the promise that he had in Freaks and Geeks. And this is the most real performance he's had since then. And everything, every moment he has is so filled with love. And he's still doing his Seth Rogen bit, being Seth Mm Rogen-y. Yeah, he's the cool stone uncle. But he is playing a man who we don't get to see alone. There's always something in his performance which is like, I hate that I have to leave because then I'll be alone. You can see that in him. Of course, the grand finale of the movie is a scene that was thrice spoiled for me. And I'll Mm -hmm. explain it to you. I'm about to spoil it for you folks if you haven't seen Fableman. David Lynch, the director, plays John Ford. The director. I won't say anything more about it. I'm just going to say how it was spoiled for me. I heard on Mark Maron, they were talking about the Fablemans, and he said and how Lynch plays Ford. And I thought, oh, David Lynch is playing Henry Ford? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I well, see that. maybe the movie's about anti-Semitism, and so that makes sense. On our last shoot, you said the greatest director playing one of the greatest directors. Henry. Oh, oh, it's John Ford. So then that 
That was the second spoiler. Mm -hmm. And then the third spoiler was Steven Spielberg himself, because I've heard him tell that story. Mm -hmm. I believe he tells it in the Images of Light documentary, the one about cinematography. He tells the whole story about going into John Ford's office, looking at the paintings and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. So once I made that connection with you, and then I was like, oh, it's that scene. That's going to be in the movie. So I was excited to see that scene. Yeah. Sarcastic sidekick. Have you seen the remake of It's All Quiet on the Western Front? (laughs) Seen it. I thought it was called Show It Is Quiet Today on the Western Front. (laughs) Um, It's a bit dark. Yeah. A bit bleak. Yeah, yeah. But this isn't your first dance with All Quiet. You've seen the original movie. Yeah, but this one kind of kicks it into overdrive Mm -hmm. a little bit. About half an hour into the movie, the main character has been entirely come and seed. If you haven't seen the Russian movie Come and See... He's at the point that the come and see guy is half an hour in the movie, and then he's got two years more of a war to do. It's rough, and it's also the movie that never ends. Mm-hmm. You get to a certain point in that movie, and you think, oh, the movie's almost over. Wait, there's 50 more minutes in the movie? Mm-hmm. What are they going to do? Oh, they're going to do all the... Okay, okay. <laughs> well, now Shirley's came over. 30 more minutes? Mm-hmm. I was thinking about an hour and a half into the movie. And this movie hasn't been quite as brutal as it should be. And then there's the crater scene. I've seen three different versions of that. That scene always, always works. I'm killing you and I'm hugging you, yeah. you know, and I'm hiding with you, corpse The final 20 minutes, I was ready to walk away. I just said to myself, I don't want to watch this. But I did my duty as mm-hmm. a movie boy, and I did. <laughs> Jordan Rowmaker writes i wasn't a huge fan of the original top gun but top gun maverick blew me away seen it seen it that's the review that's all you have to say about this movie as far as i'm concerned i have really complicated feelings about it first of all i get really tired of like dick swinging in movies Mm -hmm. a movie trope that i hate is when someone walks into a room and they say well 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 what do we have here (laughs) that's just the worst that kind of stuff bugged me But you're going to have a movie about hotshot jet fighters. You're going to get that. Yeah. It seems like so many movies that are made, that are big budget movies, they're out to simply placate the audience rather than give them something new or challenge them. You want more Danger Zone? You already got it in the first movie, but we're going to give it to you again. Yeah. You want to see Tom Hanks on a motorcycle racing a plane? We're going to give it to you again. Tom Hanks? I didn't, you, I didn't see Tom Hanks in this movie. You want to <laughs> oh, see? Oh, he was dressed up as a colonel. You want to see <laughs> Tom Cruise racing? The, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> it fixed all the things they did wrong with the first movie. I can see that. This is our mission. This is his story arc, and this is his conflict. And so we had all of that at the beginning, as opposed to some amorphous. They're at this school, and they want to be great. They laid out the mission very clearly. Mm -hmm. Their mission is to destroy the Death Star. Exactly. They have to maneuver down a narrow valley or trench. Mm -hmm. They have to shoot an exhaust vent that's only two meters wide. Twice. (laughs) Twice. Okay, that's that's the heightening. (laughs) I have a lot of criticism of it, but I I did enjoy it. I really liked the movie. But here's what I wish would have happened. I wish that Maverick would have died. Are they going to accomplish the mission? Of course they're going to accomplish the mission. But it's an impossible mission. Of course they're going to do it. There wouldn't be a movie if they didn't accomplish Mm -hmm. the mission. But if Maverick had to give his life for the mission to be successful, that would raise the stakes of the movie really high. That would be a gut punch to the audience, and that would have been something amazing. And also, I don't think we need a third Top Gun movie. I think two is enough. Wasn't expecting in the third act of the movie for it to become a buddy escape comedy. Yeah. (laughs) It was a very weird tone shift. There's a place for you to go that is strictly necessary, and that's our website. Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. Our entire catalog of episodes are there. You know this. I I don't have to tell you this. And there are PayPal donation buttons that you can click on and make a one-time or rolling monthly donation to support this show. Your support is greatly appreciated. People do it. People like this person. David from London. Thank you, David. And Rebecca who says, seen it, trouble every day. A psychological thriller with a particular scene that gave me psychological trauma. I have not seen it. No, I haven't. Sounds interesting, though. If you want more Craig and Matt chat and you want to see us open boxes and do all kinds of fun things, you can watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. And now take a look at this. What the hell was that all about? Uh, what? You know, with Fran. 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 Ask your mom to make me a paella. We want to see this Paso Doble.